When is the right time for a business to start a demand generation strategy? Kevin, you and I have both worked in organizations that unfortunately started demand generation too late. And let me tell you, it's a terrible outcome for the marketer and for the business. Welcome to the B2B Playbook. We built this channel for small B2B marketing teams who want to drive more revenue for their business. Every week, we're showing you how to create more demand for your brand step-by-step -step using our 5Bs framework. So if you're time poor, resource strapped, but you still want to make a big impact on your business, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button down below so you don't miss an episode. Welcome back to the B2B Playbook. Listeners, we've given away our 5Bs framework for demand generation step-by-step -step in seasons one to five of the B2B Playbook podcast. And now in season six, we are answering all your demand gen questions in our mini series. Last week, we spoke about what is demand generation. We defined it. And today we're continuing this mini series. And the question that we're answering is, when is the right time for a business to start a demand generation strategy? Listeners, it's another question that we often get from yourselves, from listeners, other listeners, from people who go through the incubator and generally online when we interact with our listeners, particularly on LinkedIn and the different conversations that we have with business owners along the way. And before we really jump into that question and talk about that today, let's give a little bit more context reminder of how we got here in the first place. So we spent the last five seasons, as George said, giving away our five B's framework, a quick recap on the five B's. They were be ready, be helpful, be seen, be better, and be the best. And you've really started off by deeply understanding your customers then developing relationships with them and building trust importantly online with them, then amplifying how you're seen and really focusing in on your niches in be seen. And then finally, in Be Better and Be the Best, we talked about how to optimize that whole process as well as some of the advanced strategies and tactics that really the industry leaders are using in the B2B demand generation and general marketing as well. And in this season, season six, again, as George said, we're talking about some of the most common questions when it comes to demand generation that we have gotten that we thought we should address in a mini series right off the bat. Now that we're past the main framework and you can go back and check that out in your own time to figure out what's right for you, we thought we'd jump in and answer some of those questions that we get asked most frequently and hopefully nut out some of those answers that people are seeking the most after that framework is now in mind. Maybe you're thinking about how can I apply the framework best to our own demand generation program or how to even get started. And with the context of the definition of demand generation last week, Hopefully we're now in a better position to look at when is that right time to get started. And Kevin, you and I have both worked in organizations that unfortunately started demand generation too late. And let me tell you, it's a terrible outcome for the marketer and for the business. Kevin and I, our background was as performance marketers. So we were real experts in capturing demand. We were very good at capturing those people who are in market ready to buy right now. But what would happen, unfortunately, is we wouldn't put enough resources into generating demand to build to building trust with people before they're ready to buy. Consequently, it made it incredibly difficult for the business to scale. And Kev, just going to my whiteboard, and for those who are listening, please go and check us out on YouTube. We have plenty of graphics to go with this one. We're just going to do a quick recap of what demand generation is. Now, remember, demand generation is a go-to market strategy that builds an intense desire in your dream customer to purchase from you. So when I was talking about how Kevin and I would work in-house and we were only out there capturing demand and it made it very hard for a business to scale, that is because only 3 to 5% of your potential buyers are in market at any given time. So if your market is 100 people, only three of those are very likely to be ones that are actually actively looking to purchase a solution like yours right now. So what happens is you're going to run out of customers if you only focus on these buyers. And that's why it's so hard for organizations to scale. So I've got on my whiteboard for those that are watching, we've got really the buying journey here. It maps our favorite framework for demand generation or content framework for demand generation, which is the five stages of awareness. It's where someone goes from being unaware to being problem aware, solution aware, product aware, and most aware, which is where they purchase from you. Capturing demand is really focusing on those that are solution aware, product aware, and most aware. 
and they account for about 3% of the market. When we're speaking about demand generation, we're largely focusing on these people who are unaware and problem aware, and they actually account for about 97 percent of the market so we're there to try and build relationships with them lead them on that logical path to buying from you once they're ready and building that trust with them there's one more important statistic kevin that i want to get across when it comes to demand generation and that's 80 percent of potential customers will not buy from you unless they have heard about you before they start looking for a solution so that's a statistic from bain 80% of companies basically will not buy from you unless you have some kind of demand generation program because demand generation is what gets people to know and trust you before they're ready to buy from you. So that is a super important statistic, the consequences of which can be seen in this graph below. So let's say that you've got 10 buyers who are in market right now. There's 10 people who are ready to buy. So that's the three to 5% of people who are ready to buy right now. With that 80% statistic, that means only 20% of those are actually going to buy from you or could buy from you because they haven't heard of you before. So it's not really 10 people that will buy from you. You're all the way down to two. And so that's why it's so hard to scale. And that's why it's so important to get into demand generation as early as possible. And that's really what we're discussing today is when is the right time for your company to jump into it. And the importance that the listeners, if you remember from last week, is when you start with 100 people in market, let's just say there's 100 people that could potentially one day buy from you. That includes people who are ready to buy and those who aren't even problem aware yet. Really, that 100 people comes down to just one. So one out of 100, because of all these stats that are in play, could potentially buy from you. That's not a great number to work with. If your total addressable market, if your niche is already small, which should be if you're really able to then, if you're really wanting to then hone that message in and really serve that audience, then you're looking at just one customer at the end if you don't do this sort of demand generation work much earlier in the funnel. So that's what we're trying to flip on its head. That's what we're hoping to turn in your favor. Following demand generation, if you're following the framework as we've been talking about it, hopefully you'll turn that other 97% into a stat of people who are actually in market to buy from you as well. So that's hopefully what you're taking away from what demand gen's potential impact is. And practically we can now start to look at, okay, what is the right time? What does that look like for you then as business to then know that, okay, now's a great time to start looking at demand generation and invest more heavily into it. That's right. So if you feel like you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, it's because you probably are. That's just the way the numbers are stacking up. That's what the research shows. Kevin, before you start demand generation, because we're talking about, again, when is the right time for me to start demand generation as a business? And I do think that there is possibly one prerequisite. And I think, Kevin, that you should have product market fit, not product customer fit. Now, what's the difference between those? Okay, so you've probably heard about product market fit. That is where you have a market of people with similar problems who will buy your solution and it's made for them. Product customer fit is where a lot of companies find themselves, particularly in the early stages. And that's where you have a bunch of existing customers. They're your foundational customers. So on our whiteboard, we've got customer A, B, and C. You've got three different customers You've bent over backwards to accommodate for those customers because, hey, let's be real, we want anyone to use our product. And in doing so, we've gone actually about developing a custom solution to help make that work, to sell that into the organization, and that has solved their problem. But the issue is for each of these three different customers, your custom solution that you've created is slightly different. We've got slightly different custom solutions for each of them. And that's because they have slightly different problems. And so they need different solutions. So you've got product customer fit. But at this stage, Kevin, I wouldn't say that you have product market fit. Now, product market fit, now going back to my whiteboard, is where you've got those three customers, 10 customers, your foundational customers, and the solution that you're giving them is the same. It's not bespoke. And that's because they're, again, a group of customers who have a very similar problem. And that is product market fit as opposed to product customer fit. 
And many of you listening are going to have to try and identify whether you have product customer fit or product market fit. And if you have a large enough base of customers, you might actually be able to identify, you know what, there are probably some that we have bespoke solutions for. And then there's these other groups of customers that are really great and they pretty much use the product off the shelf as it is. And you can identify what is our product market fit. So I would definitely look at seeing, do we have product market fit before we implement our demand generation program? And I will say listeners, you don't have to force the issue. If you're at a certain stage in your development, it's natural to not have product market fit, but have product customer fit. You do have at some stages in the journey need to actually just be doing the work to come up with custom solutions, to go on that journey of discovery with your foundational clients, with a set of clients at the beginning to figure out what actually works for both your customers and yourself. And over time, these sort of patterns will develop over time. You'll figure out what is that major group that seems to be using the solution that you've come up with to that point, pretty much straight out the box and pretty much as it is without too much customization. If you've hit that point, it's really just an identifier and marker point for yourself to figure out, have I hit that point where we're potentially ready for demand generation? And one of the markers is, yes, we have hit product market fit. We don't actually need to tailor that a lot to hit that large group of people that we want to target, that we want to sell to. And when you have that group of companies with those similar traits or similar pain points or problems, then that is a key trigger for you to invest heavier into demand generation because that really is what you need. You need to have a set of pain points. You need to have similar issues that you can then really prioritize and call out in your communications with other businesses like them who are potential customers for you. And then you can take them on that journey and lead them through to the logical conclusion that your solution as it is, is the perfect solution for this group of potential clients. And it really comes down to resourcing, doesn't it, Kevin? Remember, listeners, our job as the demand gen marketer is to build an intense desire in a group of people to buy from you. And to do that, you first need to get them to prioritize their pain or the pain you want them to feel. So they start looking for a solution like yours. And then you need to lead them to that logical conclusion that you are the perfect solution for them. If we're going to do this at scale, we need to be able to bucket people and their problems so we can speak to them on a one-to-many or one-to-few basis. Otherwise, every conversation that we're having is going to have to be highly tailored and that it makes it very difficult to generate demand at scale. So that's why it's very, very important to try and identify that product market fit, identify those best customers. That's why, Kevin, it's a foundational step in our program, the B2B incubator, and why we make all marketers do that to identify if they have that product market fit. And if they don't, how can they identify where that fit is likely to be? Finally, Kevin, if you're part of the leadership team or if you're an in-house marketer and you're wondering, okay, I think maybe I should be implementing a demand generation program, but I'm not really quite sure what should my company look like if it's going to be one that does implement a demand gen program. Well, Kevin, in our experience from working with organizations, typically you're going to look at companies that are at least 20 employees in size. Just by that number of employees, typically you do have some kind of product market fit there. You normally do have something that is working, an existing go-to-market strategy, be it outbound or inbound or events-led or whatever it might be, something that is starting to work. And we can really start to use demand generation to make that process go faster. You also likely have a dedicated in-house marketer, and I actually really believe you should, because in order to champion a lot of the things that you need to make a demand generation program work, a lot of that information needs to come from within the business. So you don't need a big team of marketers. We've worked with a lot of teams with a marketing team as big as one who have built fantastic demand gen programs that have contributed great pipeline. And again, Kev, product market fit. Ideally, you're starting to find product market fit. So they're the three key things that your company should have. Some other quick notes here as you start to hit that point where you're ready to go on that demand generation journey. First, you don't have to dedicate all your budget and time to a demand generation program. You don't have to build it up from zero to 100 from first day as soon as you make that decision that, yes, internally we have product market fit and two, we're ready to invest into a demand generation program. 
You don't have to flip a switch that's all or nothing, pause everything else and do demand generation only and be demand generation led from day one. Realistically, it just doesn't happen that way. And we really wouldn't want you to do that in any case because like everything else, demand generation, your program needs to be tailored, needs to be specific, and you need to test a few different things to make sure that it's going to work for you. We've provided you the framework in the first five seasons. You can definitely follow that. But there's a lot of work, as you see, when you get into the nut of it, that you really need to do over time. And you can't actually have everything ready to go from day one. So maybe start with 10% of your time and maybe a pilot project in the demand generation space. And we've given plenty of examples quite early on in the show, but all the way back in season one, as well as some of the later seasons where we answer these specific questions around how to get a specific project started in demand generation. Think about what is most suitable to your particular case as you go through some of the framework that we outlined in season one. And then it will probably come quite naturally for you to start to make that transition plan. Okay, maybe we do 10% in the first quarter. And then depending on the results of that, we can slowly scale that up and stagger the change of the split of resources over time as you start to grow demand generation in-house and as you start to get results from that demand generation program and investment as well. And also think about demand generation activities as supporting existing acquisition. So how can you support maybe an existing founder who is really pushing the company forward by leading sales in their own right and by their own reputation? Or maybe how can you make the most of the events that you're already attending that you're starting to have good conversations at by adding a little bit more work on the demand generation side to really amplify the impact of those events once you've attended them or even before you attend them. These are the things that you can start to use as simple projects to start on that demand generation journey. It doesn't have to be, again, a zero to a hundred thing. You can start with a few projects, a few activities that are low hanging fruit for your particular business that's suited for your particular business's growth channels that you're already strong in. How can you amplify those existing strong channels as you get going in on that demand generation journey? And finally, also get your strategy down first and execute over time. The strategy will probably change over time as you get more learnings, but it's really important to document. We know this from our own experience, from talking to many different business owners and from the people going through the incubator program. One of the key benefits that people keep coming back and telling us is that the program actually helps you get the strategy down. And that is very crucial and a really key point to getting your demand generation program started. It doesn't matter if you've got all these ideas, but they're only floating in your head and you're trying to sell them into the rest of the business to varying degrees of success. If you haven't got it documented down, if you haven't got somewhere where people can refer back to, whether it's new people or people who haven't heard the strategy for a while and need to remind themselves of where we're at in the journey, then that is where that documentation really comes to the fore. You really need that information there so that everyone can be aligned at any one time and you can execute that over time. Okay, now into the key takeaways. Look, the first one is you want to start demand generation once you identify product market or service market fit. Often as the marketer, you're going to have to analyze to see if you have this fit and start that conversation internally. That is your job to do that. And finally, the earlier you start generating demand or launching your demand generation pilot, the sooner your business is going to benefit from it. The best time to start was six months ago. The second best time is today. So make sure you subscribe to this channel. We show you how to generate demand step-by-step. Step. Check out our program, the B2B Incubator, if you're ready to do it right now. And stay tuned for the rest of this demand generation mini-series where we're answering all your questions on all things demand generation and how to do it for your business in-house. Fantastic. Thanks for those key takeaways, George. And listeners, as George said there, hopefully these things will really help you get started on your demand generation journey. As always, you can find links to everything we discuss in the show notes. And we're grateful that each week, more and more marketers are tuning in every Monday. If we can ask one thing, it would be to please pass on the show to someone that you think would get value from it. And also check us out on YouTube 
we talked about a lot of different things in this episode and the different whiteboards that we show along the way to illustrate the points to hopefully make it a bit easier to digest. So make sure to check us out on YouTube as well. All that is an amazing help to us and we'd really appreciate it. Thank you, George. Thank you, listeners. Take care and see you all next week. Thank you, Kev. Thank you, listeners. Take care. Catch you next week.